Okay. Greetings, everyone in Louisville. I'm so happy to talk to you. You've been having a turbulent year with the dread, uh, the death of the wonderful uh, nurse, Brianna, and everyone being upset and other people uh, dealing with it. And uh, Mayor Greg, my friend, the Mayor Greg, who I have only met online, but when I saw the Dalai Lama sitting next to him with his head lying, <laughs> bent over on Greg's shoulder, and Greg looking very tolerant, like a like a mom, I thought it was just wonderful. So I feel I was I was I was there, and I'm also so happy to be here and participate with my dear friend Gray Henry, uh, who is when uh, her fons vitae, you know, the fountain of life. That is wonderful press and organization and uh, and all the people that she brings together and all her friends and her loved ones. I'm so happy to be with you. And uh, I am talking today in the theme of what you are talking about, which is Merton and Hinduism. And um, the yoga of the heart is so nice. I like it particularly because when I left Harvard in 1961, 62, to seek uh, teaching in India, forsaking the classroom of Eric Erickson and all kinds of, I was an English major, all sorts of Shakespearean experts and Richard Poirier, a wonderful literary man. It was because I felt that the West did not have a decent yoga of the emotions was the expression that I said to people and to myself. Uh, there was a full yoga of the body, but it was not famous then like it is now. And, um, and even what is yoga, people were, I think, really unaware at that time. And um, although, you know who wasn't unaware? Thomas Merton. He was not. And this subtitle, therefore, perfectly captures what led me to leave Harvard at that time. Although, don't worry, I went back later. <laughs> but anyway, in my senior year, I left. And actually, when I came back six years later, um, I was still a... Um, a senior from, from leave and instead of writing I don't know what state of mind I was in because the admissions man who you know processed my return in 1967 uh, he said to me ha ha you young guys always think you know everything and you made a mistake when you filled out this form applying for leave and I said why what was the mistake he said well you were supposed to apply for an indefinite leave of absence and you applied for an infinite leave of absence. <laughs> and actually you left out the syllable. And actually here you are, so it wasn't infinite. And I asked him what made him think it wasn't infinite. And then we left it at that. But uh, unsatisfying exchange. Anyway, the sort of way in I thought with Merton and Hinduism was, uh, to me, was this wonderful essay that he has in this wonderful book that Gray published and her friend called A Tribute to Gandhi, page 285. It's a short essay, but it has everything in it that we need, not only to understand Merton and Hinduism, but even to understand uh, something about politics that we desperately need to know today. And Merton, what a brilliant mind, you know, the way he writes. I just love this. It was just extraordinary what he, he writes. He was writing about Western, sort of, he, he begins with Gandhi in England, where he went wearing his dhoti in the cold English weather and uh, in 1931, and he met with Churchill and so forth. And there was the famous exchange between him and Churchill, where Churchill said, well, Mr. Gandhi, what do you think about British civilization? And so Gandhi said, British civilization? Well, now, that would be a good idea. <laughs> I really, I thought that to me has been one of my ultimate favorite, because of course he was seeking liberation from British colonial domination. And he wasn't really excited about British civilization, but it was a truly a good a, a good response to Churchill, and uh, and uh, you know the sort of the encounter between the two, Merton describes so amazingly about how uh, people were 
just, uh, you know, uh, Merton you know, had an argument with his school dormitory uh, with the football captain, who was the head prefect, who had come to turn out the flickering gaslight and who stood with a hand in his pocket and a frown on his face that was not illuminated with understanding. I insisted that Gandhi was right, that India was, with perfect justice, demanding that the British withdraw grace peacefully and go home, that the millions of people who lived in India had a perfect right to run their own country. Such sentiments were, of course, beyond comprehension to the football captain. How could Gandhi be right when he was odd? <laughs> and how could I be right if I was on the side of someone who had the wrong kind of skin? and left altogether too much of it exposed because he was wearing this Indian sort of like a lungi, you know, like a dhoti, what they call a dhoti. A counter argument was offer, offered by him, by the football captain, that it was, but it was not an argument. It was a basic and sweeping assumption that the people of India were political and moral infants, incapable of taking care of themselves, backward people, primitive, uncivilized, benighted, pagan, who could not survive without the English to do their thinking and planning for them. The British Raj was, in fact, a purely benevolent, civilizing enterprise for which the Indians were not suitably grateful. <laughs> Infuriated at the complacent idiocy of this argument, I tried to sleep and failed. I just love, I love Merton, really. What a, what a lack that I never met him. I can't believe it. He was even at Columbia, but, you know, wrong generation for me. I mean, I was the wrong generation. So, and then he goes on about the hypocrisy of the, of the Western politics and then all moving on into the World War and how, you know, in the name of peace, they waged terrible violence. In the name of humanity, they committed genocide. In the name of, etc. I mean, he goes on, Merton, on the West. So, so Merton was, was an unsparing critic of Western hypocrisy and Christianity is sort of uh, ambivalent, you know, d double dealing, like uh, George Orwell, future speak, you know, saying one thing and doing the opposite, actually, and even perceiving themselves as being holy and doing Jesus' work, and then actually being harmful and malicious and evil and, 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 and oppressive to the poor when Jesus said a rich person cannot get into heaven except through like a camel through the eye of a needle and all this. So Merton is wonderful at that. So then we come to the question Merton and Hinduism. Well, Merton is not into ism, actually. And just like he's not into Christianism or iti, you know, Christian iti, he's into Jesus. And therefore he sees uh, he, he, he appraises in here so beautifully how Gandhi understands Christ. And he says um, that he, he completely, of course he doesn't believe in Christ, that Christ will, will save everybody in the same way as a Christian does, but he believes that the principles that Christ teaches and the example of altruism and selflessness and self-transcendence, and love instead of hatred, and so forth, and embrace of and and equality of of humans and beings and the poor, and of course, Hinduism, not all forms of Hinduism, but most of them feel that animals have souls, and you know the Hinduism became very vegetarian because Hinduism doesn't only have the Vedic strand in it. Merton easily saw the, what is what we what is called the shramanic strand, like Jainism and Buddhism and the and the ascetical element, the yogic element in Hinduism, where the individual becomes ahimsa and they become vegetarian, not to harm animals, and they they love the cow, you know, and they and they're grateful for the cow and all of that, and um, so of course he perfectly loved them. And it is the greatest loss to modern Christianity, actually, that Merton was, what, either murdered or died accidentally, just when he was really eloquently discovering, when he had just met the Dalai Lama, he had met great other elders, St. Dalai Lama was a young kid at that time, and um, he met him, actually, a little bit after I met him, but unfortunately I wasn't still there when Merton came. You know, I was being a monk someplace. And Merton, uh, but I wish I had been really. But my friend, uh, 
uh, some of my friends were helping Merton meet uh, His Holiness uh, Hal Harold Talbot, a wonderful Christian man named ha Buddhist Christian person named Har Harold Talbot. Chris Boo, you know, there's a lot of Jew Boos. We have Jew Boos, but we don't have enough Chris Boos, and we don't have enough uh, enough enough uh, Mus Boos, which would be good to have. And what they what that means is that you know, according to modern Buddhism and always Hinduism, you know, you know, you can be, you can seek the divine, you can seek the holy, you can seek the true, you can devote yourself to truth and reality, um, and you know, in more ways than one, and you really you can see the unity of all of them, you know, like. As my friend James Morton, James Parks Morton used to say, and also a great friend of Gray's, he used to say, God is greater than any of his religions. He used to say that. And those who really have true faith, rather than just sort of brainwashed indoctrination, but those who have true faith, uh, they, uh, they, they would never restrict what a God can do according to some dogma, to you know what the divine is capable of. And the Buddhists, of course, also, it's a very wrong thing that many people thought, and Merton knew better. He had an epiphany in front of the great, uh, uh, thank you, uh, you know, I'm giving a talk. Uh, Siri, please hang out, okay. <laughs> Siri likes to define the, my terms in the middle of a lecture or something and say something. So that's okay, I don't need that. that. The audience doesn't need it. <laughs> and... Uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, the, there's a there's a wrong notion that uh, Buddhism is non-theistic, or even atheistic, and I think some early translators of Buddhism were themselves trying to escape from monotheism, and so they assumed that since Buddhism didn't believe in a creator or critiques the idea of any one God being the creator. But nevertheless, you know, therefore is atheistic, but that's not true, because the Buddhists think of very powerful great gods who others might see as creators, and the Buddhists say, well, we don't blame everything on such a being. There are good gods, and there, there are demons, and, uh, and, but no one is to blame for evil, you know. We all have our share in evil, we all have our responsibility to be good. It has that sort of view, but that doesn't mean they're non-theistic because there are so many gods, actually. The divine manifests in so many ways. You know, the divine can be a bush, that, uh, not the bush family, but a burning bush uh, in, in, in Arabia that spoke to Moses. A God can, a God can manifest in many ways, and, and then no one can say, oh, because he's, he spoke to Moses as a burning bush, I'm only going to worship burning bushes. I mean, that's ridiculous. And um, so Merton, I'm sure, loved, and he had this great epiphany. That's right, that's where I was. When he had a great epiphany sitting in front of the lying down Parinirvana Buddha carved in stone about 40 feet long in Sri Lanka. And, uh, and he wrote about that in his Asian journals. And it was really amazing what he felt in front of that. And, and I, I, when I went there, I completely was with Merton, I felt. And actually, a very interesting man called Ronnie Lang came a few years after Merton, a little bit, or a year or two after Merton, and he also had an epiphany there. And he had like a, uh, you know, he was, not a, he was not a Christian, he was a psychiatrist. So to, he was able to have the epiphany without worrying whether he was being disloyal or something. And, um, and so Merton found God and Jesus in Hinduism himself, he didn't insist that Gandhi found Jesus and the way that a Christian might find Jesus, but he insisted that Gandhi was perhaps living up to Jesus' point of view as a Hindu. Actually, Gandhi's mother was a Jain, uh, and Gandhi, so Gandhi sort of, and Gandhi was in the tradition after the great Ramakrishna, who became a completely devoted uh, Christian completely devoted Hindu, completely devoted Muslim. I believe those are only the three. He didn't get on to Buddhism at the t because he didn't have time. And he wanted to do each one completely perfectly and feel that he reached the same place in, in, in communion with the divine through these different uh, vehicles. And of course, within Hinduism, you can approach God as a woman 
without worrying about the guys being freaked out. And you can approach him as a male also, either because they, who, who are we if you really, really have faith in some sort of divine goodness in the universe? Who are you to say how it's going to express itself? Just because you read a book which was written down by humans and maybe there was a typo in there, you know? You never know because humans make mistakes. And uh, don't tell me that that's God's word. Just, you know, somebody wrote it down and then they translated it in other languages and this and that. You know, and it's silly to get like that. I, it's like the famous joke that the Chicago theologians say uh, that was told me by my great informant on the Chicago theologians, uh, Langdon Gilkey, where a lady was really angry when the Chicago press published a, a Vulgate Bible, that was to say a colloquial Bible with no these and thous in it, you know, but just you and so on. And she wrote a letter to the editor, uh, to the publisher, a very angry letter, and her bottom line, her sort of Zen aphorism was, if the King James Version is good enough for Jesus, it should be good enough for you. <laughs> as, if, as if, in her mind, Jesus spoke English. And <laughs> say, 16th century, 17th century English of Shakespeare, nonsense, you know. So, so let's 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 be real. Okay. So there's a couple of passages in here I really liked. Um, uh, you know that in, in that he said that Merton said this. What isn't always me talking? He said, uh, "What has Gandhi to do with Christianity? Everyone knows that the Orient has venerated Christ and distrusted Christians <laughs> since the first colonizers and missionaries came from the West." Yes, there's a thing in uh, Buddhism, there's a med meditative state called immeasurable love, uh, you, know, you know, a pramana mai maitri, and um, the word sort of midway between the word for mater, mother, and mitra, friend, it's love, you know, and uh, selfless love. And, but the Buddhists translated that, and they still do, Sharon Salzberg and other such meditators and teachers, they say loving kindness. Loving kindness, they sort of run it as one word. And the reason that, they, that, the, that the Asians got into writing that is that they had these missionaries landing on their shores talking about love and how much they loved them and then killing them and enslaving them. So they had to, throw, they had to put kindness in there. So they never translate love. They get annoyed with me when I say, actually, guys, that's love. He's talking about love. And they get mad. And this Buddha is talking about love. They say, no, no, he's talking about loving kindness, he said, because they want to make sure that the love is actually working for the happiness of the beloved and not enslaving or killing the beloved, as sometimes, unfortunately, the colonialists did. Okay, so he says here, the point does not need to be argued here or something about. He's not trying to pretend that Gandhi was somehow a card-carrying Christian. However, he says, Gandhi certainly spoke often of Jesus, whom he had learned to know through Tolstoy, and Gandhi knew the New Testament thoroughly. Whether or not Gandhi believed in, quote-unquote, Jesus in the same sense that he had genuine Christian faith in the gospel would be very difficult to demonstrate, and it is not my business to prove it or disprove it. I think that the effort to do so would be irrelevant in any case. What is certainly true is that Gandhi not only understood the ethic of the gospel as well, if not in some ways better than many Christians, but he is one of the very few men of our time who applied gospel principles to the problems of a political and social existence in such a way that, has, that his approach to these problems was inseparably religious and political at the same time. And this is so wonderful because we have the terrible thing here in America today of people who consider themselves very devoted Christians but behaving politically very violently, very oppressively, very in, in, uh, uncharitably and unlovingly toward people that they consider of a different race, people they consider of a different nationality, people they consider of a different class, and an economic bracket and so forth. And really, that's really terrible, you see. And he brilliantly says here, which, which is, it's about Gandhi, but this is also about 
the good side of Hinduism that Merton can see. And let me just say one thing. Merton never met His Holiness the Dalai Lama, as far as we know. That on a spiritual plane, he might be chatting with all 13 previous Dalai Lamas in some wonderful dialogue place in, in heaven, sort of uh, 150 miles beyond the atmosphere above Gethsemane right this minute, as far as we know. What, they, what happens to people after death, especially holy people and great yogis and meditators. But the point is he never did meet him. But his understanding of religion and politics and, and through Gandhi, through his analysis of Gandhi, is really extraordinary. He says Gandhi's whole concept of man's relation to his whole inner being and to the world of objects around him was informed by the contemplative heritage of Hinduism, together with the principles of Karma Yoga, which because Hind, you know Merton had read the Bhagavad Gita for sure, and which blended in his thought with the ethic of the Synoptic Gospels and the Sermon on the Mount. In such a view, politics had to be understood in the context of service and worship, in the ancient sense of liturgia. Now there he goes beyond me in the Greek learning. It's a Greek, I guess, for liturgy, public work, which liturgy doesn't just mean some ceremony in church on Sunday, and then in public you act like a mean person. You know, liturgy means, you know, the ritual of being public, and that is, you know, voting and helping others cross the street and helping others vote and helping others learn and helping others eat and helping others be healthy and all of these things that good Christians in our country and, and saving God's environment, which God, the planet, which God created, as you believe, for humans to enjoy and to learn to worship him and therefore is well made and perfect and should not be despoiled and destroyed. And he doesn't have to make another one because you think you're, you're, you're free to ruin this one. No, no, no. In the ancient sense of liturgy, I just love that. Man's intervention in the active life of society was at the same time by its very nature, Svadharma, his own duty, his own personal service of God and man, I would like to say, and humans, and worship, yadnya, he was his, which means sacrifice, actually, in, literally worship, he's calling it. Political action, therefore, was not a means to acquire security and strength for oneself and one's party, but a means of witnessing to the truth and the reality of the cosmic structure by making one's own proper contribution to the order willed by God. One could thus preserve one's integrity and peace, being detached from results which are in the hands of God, and being free from the inner violence that comes from division and untruth, the usurpation of someone else's dharma or duty or truth in place of one's own truth. These perspectives lent Gandhi's politics their extraordinary spiritual force and religious realism. Now, I'm not saying that Merton had to go to Hinduism to discover an ethical politics and a truly moral and even religious, or maybe nowadays he would use the word spiritual, since organized religions have gotten themselves a bit of a bad name nowadays by behaving in non-spiritual and non-religious ways. And therefore people prefer to identify themselves as spiritual and not religious. A huge part, tens of millions of people do. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, But what I'm saying is that Merton, having learned himself as a Christian devoted monastic and a, and a contemplative, having seen the idiocy and the insanity of this hypocrisy of doing violence in the name of peace, of committing genocide in the name of saving humanity, of, uh, of, uh, of being miserly and covetous and greedy in the name of, of charity and freedom, of imprisoning others in the name of freedom, etc. This kind of hypocrisy, he learned that from his own teaching by Jesus <laughs> and the good side which after all Jesus remember folks let's never forget Jesus was a rabbi and his own followers when they said to him teacher they said the word rabbi because that's it that's the Hebrew for teacher and so they called him a rabbi rabbi 
and he was, he, you know, he was Jewish. Don't, let's not forget that. And he was killed by Italians, by Romans, not by Jews. So let's get over that one. But anyway, he learned that from Jesus. But then he saw the same there in Hinduism. And this relates to, in the modern sense, I am sure that if Merton were alive today, and he would embrace the Dalai Lama's theory that people, religious people, should find the ultimate goal of their own faith in every other faith. And not that they would then switch to these other faiths. They would go to the ultimate themselves through the full embrace of their own faith. But they would allow God to approach others through other faiths and receive their worship and their enlightenment and their holiness through those other faiths so as not to feel compelled to somehow invade them and occupy them and disrespect their belief systems and and kill them even before being infidels at the worst case and and, and uh, not accept that they can also do the ultimate ultimate recognizing that many people in one's own faith don't live up to the dictates of that faith they're sinners they do evil they do wrong and they misunderstand their great teachers like Jesus or Buddha or Krishna or Lao Tzu or Confucius or whoever it might be uh, and therefore it's that, that not everyone will be holy in any other religion either but they, they all have that ability and the Dalai Lama I, I remember translating for him at Harvard Divinity School and where he said that he there were Buddhists who were what he would call triumphant. He didn't use this word, but we ne we nowadays in interreligious interfaith language we call it triumphalist, thinking they're supposed to conquer people with other ideologies or religions. And he said he he had learned a kind of Buddhism that was like that, where people thought well nobody could really became attain liberation or freedom from suffering or salvation uh, without Buddhism. But he had weaned himself off of that. In the exclusivistic type of attitude and he had met Thomas Merton and he had met Christian monast mystics in Spain and he had met etc cetera, etc cetera, other people in other faiths which he felt they fully fully realized whatever he could realize through Buddhism and so he should fully respect the teaching of their teachers and which doesn't mean he couldn't wouldn't you wouldn't learn from each other's religions but it mean and you would keep it in your in the context of your own faith but you would fully respect them and give up what would turn into in a modern linked together world where you don't have a really christian country or a muslim country or a jewish country or a buddhist country like tibet had been a buddhist country and and this country had been a so-called Christian country, and that one had been, so that that was sort of the orthodoxy. And America is supposed to be, no, the government is not supposed to interfere with religion. There is not supposed to be a state religion in order to avoid religious mutual persecution. And that is the modern thing, and in that, religious theology has to adapt to that. And, uh, for example, you can say, well, Jesus said once, only through me can you come to the Father. Yeah, but you have to look at the context. He said that, why? He was not referring to, you couldn't do it through Hinduism or Buddhism or Confucianism because he wasn't involved with those traditions. And nobody was suggesting that they, that they were going to go do it through some other things. He was healing someone on the Sabbath and he was therefore breaking a Leviticus law of Judaism. And so he was saying rigid Judaism by some sort of book is not going to get you to the father i'm in, i'm teaching what the father teaches i'm a rabbi and so i can do what the spirit calls me to do and so should you and not just act like you're pure by the book and you can be mean to other people who are not so he's it's a context he says that he didn't say that to mean christianity is supposed to conquer the world like a certain person I know in, with his authority in the Christian tradition informed everybody in Mumbai that he was going to conquer Asia in the third millennium, which they didn't take too very kindly, the people in Mumbai mostly. And it's, that doesn't mean people can't be Christian in Asia. There are millions of them, and that's fine. Let them be that. But, but, but conquer, the idea of conquering in the name of a religion of love and altruism, conquering another, is just wrong. And and that wasn't taught by Jesus. He taught people to conquer themselves, 
to conquer their inner hatred, their inner violence, their inner delusion. And that's what, the, well, that's what Hindu yoga of the emotions is about. And Merton could see that because he was used, not because he loved Hinduism particularly, but because he learned that through properly learning Christianity and properly trying to put it into practice. So thank you very much, everyone. And, uh, and I'm so honored that you invited me to join you. And Greg Fisher, I'm so sorry I'm not physically there that we can't have an elbow hug but uh, in these days of COVID. But I hope to get there and see you soon. And uh, I, if Gray invites me, I will always come. Thank you, Gray, so much. And uh, thank you, thank you, Mustafa and Neville and everyone. Okay, all the best.